Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. So there's a lot of ways that sound influences us, but it also influences the world around us. And I also talk about that here. And you talk about that in the context of helping plants to grow and food sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could touch a little on that and how it works there. So um, I started looking at um, like uh, different research about uh, how music could inf in, uh, influence the growth of plants. And usually the ones that are more open to this type of uh, research were um, like India or China, they, they were more uh, open to do this kind of research with, um, with plants, something that's maybe not that prominent in the, in the West. So I, I, I stumbled across many research from, from, the, from the East. And uh, one that was particularly interesting uh, was one that was um, um, research from India from 2014, where they would put um, 60 minutes of music at 6 a.m. in the morning for around 62 days on rose plants. They would uh, put uh, three conditions, music conditions with uh, loudspeakers. So one uh, group of plants of rose plants would listen to uh, Vedic chants. Uh, that's why it's an Indian uh, research paper. Um, mm -hmm. Then they would listen to Western classical music, another group and, and a third group would listen to rock music. Uh, so it was 60 minutes every day for 62 days at 6 a.m. And then uh, they started seeing that there were differences of how plants were growing um, and they found some interesting results. So the Vedic chants and the Western classical music, they found that uh, there were, uh, the plants grew taller, they had uh, bigger flowers and they had more flowers than the uh, rock condition. And they also saw that the plants were growing towards the speaker as if they wanted to embrace it even more. But something completely different happened with rock music. They had uh, fewer flowers. They had, they were smaller in size. They were the first ones to sprout thorns and had even more of those thorns as a way to defend themselves against this stressful situation. And um, they also had this um, behavior that they uh, grew away from the speaker as if trying to get rid of, of this stressful situation. Uh, so that was very enlightening to see that plants could react to human m music in such a way, such a notorious way. And they have preferences, apparently. And they have preferences, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's quite something. <laughs> yeah, and you see uh, research after research, uh, there's mm -hmm. a similar trend that rock music, heavy metal and similar uh, genres are detrimental to their growth. Why do you think that is? Is that because it's loud or is that because it has certain frequencies or what's your thoughts on that? Uh, one explanation I think is that uh, since these sound winds are more intense and um, they are uh, like this vibrations uh, stress them out, um, mm -hmm. it makes them uh, more their surroundings become more threatening to them. Ah, okay. So that makes them adapt to this. Uh, and since they can't really, you know, walk away, they just start uh, creating other ways to defend themselves against this kind of threat. Uh, so in the case of rose plants, more thorns um, and trying to get away from while they were uh, growing, trying to get away from the loudspeaker. That's really interesting. Yeah. So in 
that kind of an instance then, knowing that research, what would you suggest people use music for? Like, how could they then, I'm assuming this would work with any kind of plant. Have they, is it just roses or or any kind of plant? No, no, they tried with different plants, uh, cabbage, okay. uh, vegetables, like um, they've tried um, with uh, yeah, different uh, species of plants. And uh, if you had a garden, uh, what I would recommend is uh, use soft music, classical music, Vedic chants, even Quran recitings, anything that's like soothing uh, to yourself. You could also think about that it's soothing to the plant. Um, you could also use uh, music that's uh, in a, let's say, volume level uh, moderate or low, which would be uh, lower than 80 decibels. And I would also recommend, given this research, to use maximum three hours of music per day. And if you want to see results, at least for four weeks, okay. which is the one they would use that in these research. That is really research. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So on the flip side of this, though, you also talk about breaking down the material with sound. So, so where does that fit into all of this? Because we're going full circle in this book of yours. <laughs> and, and, and we need to, to see the whole food cycle. So, yes, uh, yeah. well, I mean, this, this part of the cycle is the least, uh, least research field of the food life cycle when it regards to how music influences this part. Um, but it's important to see that there are things we can do about it uh, with um, for instance, wastewater. We are expert, experts at producing waste, including wastewater. And um, more than 80% of this uh, wastewater is released untreated in developing countries. So that's the bad news. But the good news is that we can do something about it. So wastewater has different sources. You can have industrial wastewater, you can have uh, residential sources. Um, and the research, when it comes to music, focused on residential sources. So you have um, water from toilets, sinks, showers, washing machines. And um, how can you use reuse this um, wastewater to, for human consumption? Because um, you know all these resources are limited. So what what can we do to um, be more efficient about how we treat those uh, wastewater in this case. So we can treat wastewater uh, chemically. We can throw some chemicals and try to um, clean it up. We can use physical aspects like separating its sedimentation. We can also use uh, biological ways, ways of um, treating wastewater. And this is where it gets interesting with uh, uh, these microorganisms, which you can use to break down uh, organic matter and make uh, this uh, water, uh, you, you can you reuse the water after you break it down and you treat it. So there was a research that focused on, on microbes. How can you use, you need either more microbes, more workers, let's say, to break down this um, organic matter or you need that the workers you already have, these microbes, to be better at metabolizing or breaking down this organic matter. So you would influence either the colonies of these microbes or their metabolic activity, or both. So um, scientists uh, put loudspeakers uh, in these wastewater treatment plants, and uh, they were able to increase uh, the growth of these microbes. And, you know, we were talking about how rock and heavy metal was detrimental to the growth of plants. Interestingly, uh, when it came to one of these microbes called E. coli, music was actually beneficial to their growth. Um, certain, um, let's say, music genres can increase up to 40% the growth rate of, of these microbes. And it was interesting to see this contrast uh, with E. coli, uh, heavy metal was the, the best one. But there are also other uh, microbes that respond better to, let's say, classical music. 
Um, so you can use, uh, and there was also, for instance, another, uh, um, in this case, it was a sewage uh, treatment plant in Germany that um, used Mozart operas to reduce, in this case, the sludge that was generated uh, in these tanks. And after a year of using these uh, this classical music, they were able to save 10,000 euros in the cost of transporting this sludge. So they reduced the amount of sludge produced by um, these sewage treatment plants. Uh, wow, just, that's pretty incredible. Just with music. Just with music. That was their only uh, variable. Um, and you could focus in on different types of organisms depending on the type of music that you that you played. That's really astounding. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you, yeah. you need to so know there's... your client, right? You need to know I what they like. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. That is pretty amazing. Speaking of the client, though, <laughs> so you you also say in your book. Uh, and this is a direct quote, what happens when retailers learn how to strategically use music to meet their goals? Often their tactics remain hidden from us, the customers, as we engage in our shopping experiences, yet the results can be nothing short of astonishing. And as we've already seen, there's lots to be astonished by yep. here. But when it comes to retail, what do you think? Can you talk a little about that? Uh, so let me remind a little bit. So I, I studied film yeah. scoring and okay. they always uh, taught us that when you created music for a scene, th the music shouldn't be something that they would, that would drive at attention away from the scene. So we had to um, become part of the scene like uh, naturally and just uh, support what was happening there to enhance what was already there. If there was sadness, uh, supported with music. If there was anxiety, do that. So the same uh, principle applies when you use it in retail stores. You want the music to be something that isn't something that stands out because you want them to be immersed in this experience, shopping experience. Um, and music is one of these elements you can use, you can mani manipulate to uh, drive their behavior. So, for instance, you can use uh, the tempo of the music to make people either shop more f faster or slower because they would uh, unconsciously adapt to the sound cues that were at, the, at that moment happening. So, if the music was uh, fast-paced, they would unconsciously, unconsciously uh, start uh, walking faster uh, towards uh, throughout the aisles. Um, and this is uh, beneficial when you have a lot of customers and you want them to come and go. So you could use that in that instance. Or if there's, uh, if you want them to shop to to maybe spend more um, money and you know focus more on on certain items, you would make it uh, the muse music uh, slower. So this is one way uh, with tempo. But you can also use uh, other cues uh, to to manipulate how people uh, react to to let's say to their purchasing intention. Um, the main thing in all of this is that if you can transmit a positive experience for them, that would uh, also influence how they see uh, the store, the people in the store, the people working in the store, uh, the the items that are being displayed. And that can uh, even be more important than the item itself, because what makes them feel good, they would trespass these emotions towards what's happening around this. And what they have in that moment is uh, th these uh, items that they're trying to purchase. So, um, but music has to be seamlessly uh, integrated into this experience. And you can also use, like, let's say, music. I don't know if you heard about music zoning, uh, which would be having uh, different types of uh, music depending on the zone inside the store. If it's a big store, where they are yeah. uh, going through. So uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland yes, or wherever. I've been there. But if you, yeah, so if you go to Disney, they have different sections, the same that you're talking about zones, and they're built so self-contained that you can go from like the step of in in front of a hedge 
to the other side of that hedge and you're hearing completely different music. Oh. It's a completely different environment. So they have that built with the proper speakers, the directional speakers, the way that the trees and the hedges are positioned, just to make sure that the music can change so specifically to match the zone that you happen to be in. So yeah, Disney has got this down pat and they've been doing it for years. So yeah, not a new practice, but really an interesting uh, acceptance that we've started using it in retail and you know different sections of, of retail more consciously, I guess. Yeah, I would say it's like- It's really uh, fascinating. I would say that you know that uh, when uh, they work on NASA, they, they work on creating different, uh, I think the Velcro maybe was invented. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the same. Maybe uh, Disney would be the, like the NASA where they, you know, they're on the forefront of innovation yeah. and then you go. They developed it and other people took it on. Exactly, yeah. To retail. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's, it's totally fascinating to me. But with talking about zones, now this is something in the book that really fascinated me. So you say that um, uh, companies and public institutions commonly apply what is known as defensive urban design. Mm -hmm. So defensive urban design, we're talking about zones of sound that uh, you say, along with improving streetlights or trimming shrubbery, music has been used as part of a larger strategy to prevent crime in a number of jurisdictions. Can you talk about how this works? So you've probably seen uh, when you go into a bus stop that the um, sitting down at the bus stop is not as comfortable as you would like, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So that's that's one way uh, to apply defensive urbanism to uh, make it a little bit uncomfortable or make this encourage people to stay for long in certain places. Uh, in this case, in the uh, on benches or or whatever, and the same principle applies to uh, music. So. For instance, they've used music uh, in, in, in front of McDonald's or other uh, places that are not usually linked with uh, this type of maybe environment. Let's say they will usually use classical music, which is sad because then, you know, the ramifications is that classical music is associated with something uh, that people dislike. But anyway, that's how, how they've used it. Um, so they would... Uh, put through loudspeakers classical music uh, on a high volume to discourage people from being in certain places. So in, fr in front of a McDonald's, in front of a 7-Eleven, um, in a way to discourage what can happen afterwards. If, uh, if there are, I don't know, some people gathering around a place, uh, they could then maybe uh, do some kind of act that goes against this establishment that it's in front of them. Um, and if you put loud music, first of all, you don't want you, you don't want to talk with other people if they're with loud music. Uh, you, you can't even talk to them. So why would you stay in that place? So it's discouraging people from being there. Uh, second, uh, maybe if they're, let's say, teenagers hanging around this establishment, um, listening to classical music, which is not usually what teenagers listen to. Uh, if somebody else sees them listening to this, they are not cool anymore, right? So they don't want to be next to a place that can in any way or form link them to this kind of music. They can't be uncool. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's another way of discouraging them from being at, at those places. So I, I want to ask you, I do like to get a little philosophical in here. We've talked a lot about specific things, and, and I mm -hmm. love that. I love that there's been a lot of research on this and that people are actually experimenting with this and learning new things. I think it's absolutely fantastic and should be done more. But why do you think sound is important? I always like to ask this just because it's it's one of those things I always like to see how people will answer. Like, what mm -hmm. does it mean to you? Um, I think that most of uh, the awareness we have about the world is through first sight and then sound. Um, we perceive and engage with our environments 
by looking at uh, things, learning from what we look from what others do, uh, but also being aware of uh, threatful noises and for survival, for instance. So, of course, we also have these other senses, smell, touch, taste. But in the day day to day, uh, we are not that aware of them. Um, and also, whenever you come across different studies or surveys, people always say the same. Uh, they say that sight is the most important sense, then they say hearing, and then there's a variation of the other uh, last three senses. So in a way, sound is pretty high on this ranking. Uh, so there's like a biological, let's say, um, way of thinking about why sound is so important to, to us. But I would also think about sound in a more complex way, which is music, um, that we also have a misconception uh, or maybe a narrow view of what music is. Um, I don't know if I talked about this, but... Uh, you can totally talk about it now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no, no. That we typically think about music as a listening experience, uh, mm -hmm. playing an instrument, dancing, and I think that's like a narrow view of, of seeing, of looking at, at this uh, concept of music. And that was one of the inspirations, what I wanted to do this book to show that there's another way of thinking about music that's completely different from this, let's say, three main ways we think about music. Um, so if you step a little bit outside these traditional associations we have uh, with uh, what music is, you can find that, as we talked about, sound can affect plant development, it can influence the growth, the health of the plant, uh, it can alter our sense of taste, uh, enhance or diminish their flavors, it can impact our moods, it can uplift us, calm us, energize us, and well, audio branding uses that a lot because emotions sell at the end of the day. And even specific frequencies can activate uh, cells to pump insulin as an alternative to uh, a treatment for diabetes type 1, which is something mind-blowing. That's uh, fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, they, they found that there was uh, certain frequencies, uh, usually in the low range, 50 to 100 kilohertz, where you could st stimulate with sound certain cells and 70% of the insulin was released in the first five minutes. So instead of uh, putting a needle in you, uh, you would just listen to music and uh, after uh, being exposed to music, certain music, uh, you would be re releasing the, the insulin you need to, to function. Um, and there's no risk of overdosing on, on music, as we talked about. So, uh, in fact, in fact, you, they used uh, Queen's as "We Will Rock You," uh, oh, I which love works. It. Yeah, works best in this case. One of my um, favorite songs. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very powerful. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I want to say is that you know, there's more to sound than 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 we know of. And if we know how to, if we know that music is a powerful tool. Uh, we just have to learn these different ways of how it interacts with our psyche, with our body, with uh, the, the other elements, with uh, plants, to make use of it in the most powerful way. Um, so, I mean, when you start researching about all this, you uh, find out that music is much more and it makes it this philosophical question becomes like a necessity in your life yeah, because it's it's we need music to to be better human beings yeah it is so super important yeah definitely i love talking about it clearly you do too <laughs> so what would be I, your take? I love yeah yeah so i i love this book so just for anyone who is interested in picking it up you can probably get it from amazon uh it's called sounds from farm to fork and back how audio and music can enhance the food life cycle and uh, I really highly recommend that uh, people pick it up. I think it's a really interesting read. And I have so many pages here marked that, that I uh, that I need to look into a little more and, and 
sit with a bit to understand. It's really, really fascinating stuff. So yeah, thank you so much, Pavle. This has been absolutely fantastic. How can people get in touch with you if they'd like to do that? Um, maybe the show notes, uh, I can leave uh, my LinkedIn profile and my Medium uh, profile, sure. which is where I write a lot about uh, music or my newsletter, uh, sound awareness. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think I mentioned, well, not not here, but um, like if, if you get the book, I can also uh, give a free copy of the my first book, which is how to hook your customer with music, which is also more related to audio branding and how can you use music in a business environment. Sure. Uh, so you get two, two, two for one, let's say. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and no, thank you. <laughs> so are you working on anything now that you can discuss? Your, your, um, your newsletter is a regular thing that comes out on Sundays. Am I correct? Every Sunday at 12. Yeah. I, okay. I have a, yes, uh, my newsletter. I'm also always writing about music. Um, I'm also, uh, consulting on audio branding, uh, mm -hmm. with people that, uh, have some, like, let's say, um, problems with how to, uh, strategize about, uh, creating a strategy for audio branding for a certain client. I help them with that. And I also been recently invited to go to talk to um, people in the food industry that they researches in the agricultural part and also, um, yeah, mainly in the agricultural part, uh, like field to talk about how music can, maybe they could do some research with music. So that can, will also be very uh, interesting to learn, to, to see people that, you know, they're, completely into this, but they don't know anything about sound affecting uh, the work they do. So that's also going to be uh, an interesting workshop I'll do maybe in September. And well, of course, promoting my, my book uh, in any way possible. And, and that's why sure. I'm very thankful uh, to, to, to have this kind of opportunity to talk with you about this and you being such a great host and engaging. So it makes me, it, it inspires me to talk about this even more. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to join me today. Yeah. And I look forward to hearing more about your talk in September when that happens. We may have to come back here and try this again, see how we yeah, can maybe. have another conversation <laughs> on this because, yeah, it is really super interesting. So, yeah, thank you so much, Pavle. I, I am looking forward to hearing what you're going to do in the future. Thank you very much for having me. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.